in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light shine through. If you believe it's true, baby, won't you let the light small and tremulous, was swallowed by the darkness. There was nothing around her, nothing in any direction. Not a glimmer of light, no walls, no ceiling, no floor. H hello She called out, raising her voice now in the hopes of being heard, but there was no answer, not even an echo. I is anyone there? Silence. Twilight bit her bottom lip, turning slowly in place, her small hooves making not a noise. She could see herself, though just how or why she could, with the world being barren of any light, was beyond her. It was a disquieting sensation. But the little filly didn't feel afraid. There was something inexplicably comforting about this place. Why not like to sleep by the light of the moon, or with the night light on, to chase away the worrisome mystery of darkness? Here, though, with nothing but darkness all round, and a place she did not know, she felt warm, somehow. Like she was being held by her mother and father, or being wrapped up in the fluffy familiarity of her blankets, and snuggled up tight against the chill of winter's night. She called out again, louder, braver, but there was no answer. Frowning now, the filly began to walk. There was nothing to walk towards, and nothing to walk away from, but there was little else to be done, so she walked. The darkness was solid enough under hoof, though just what it felt like was hard to really discern. Even stranger was the slope that had appeared in the world without shape or contour. She found herself climbing upwards, then down a gentle gradient, like she had crossed over a small hill, Driven by spontaneous thought, Twilight stopped and tried to dig at the ground with the tip of a hoof, but it left no mark that she could see or feel. She raised a hoof to walk onwards, but hesitated as a memory flared to life. A memory of what had happened before this darkness. She had been at the examination, standing at the centre of the lecture room stage. In front of her was a hundred seats empty save for the shapes of half a dozen judges watching her from the very top of the amphitheatre. Their expressions were disdainful and disinterested. Her parents had been there too, so hopeful and excited for her, watching their daughter try to earn a place at one of the most exclusive and prestigious schools in Equestria. Watching her try. Watching her fail. Twilight hung her head, a tear glittering in the corner of her eye. She had tried so hard, given everything she had to show her worth. It was supposed to be a special day for her parents, approving of their pride that ended up as nothing more than a pathetic fizzle of sparks. No doubt every other student in the school had passed the test without even breaking a sweat. They probably strolled right by. I swear I'm going soft. I should be flying more instead of... instead... Just what have I been doing lately anyways? The ponies must all think I've disappeared. Heck, poor Scoots must be planning my funeral by now. I should pay the little squirt a visit sometime, just to play face, assuming Apple Bloom isn't telling her all sorts of wild stories to confuse her orange noggin. I don't even know what the red-headed kid thinks of this. This... whatever this is. Awesome. That's what it is. Heh. <laughs> Ah, soon every pony's gonna know. Then what am I gonna say? I'm not good at public speeches. Heck, it's not like I gotta be all public about it, even if I have an image to protect. The Wonderbolts don't want to be inducting a softie, right? So what if most of them are bachelors and bachelorettes? I can still blend in with them, right? 
After all, there's got to be some pony in the whole lot who's got... I, I mean, a pony who's joined with another at the... The... Darn it! My ears hurt so friggin' much. What I wouldn't give for a nice scratch. I mean, heck, I guess I could ask you, but I kind of sort of like it when I don't have to ask. Ugh, I am becoming a softie, aren't I? That's it. We gotta talk about this. We gotta lay down parameters or ground rules or something because... Because... Oh gosh, there you are. That speck of rusty country orange in the middle of so much green. Oh jeez. Oh jeez, I don't mind being a softie at all. Uh-uh. Not one bit. Hmm. <sighs> Life is good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. What the heck are you doing? Is that a spreadsheet in front of you? Bucket. What the heck are you doing? I ask. I exhale, touching down in a burst of air, kicking loose blades of grass across your shiny, shiny fetlocks. Whoa, you must have been working hard today, haven't you? Been working hard? That's a lot of friggin' sweat. You haven't showered yet, I bet. Oh, jeez, are my cheeks burning already? Oh, um, hey there, I guess. Hey yourself, you grunt. Whoa, did Bloomberg Jr. kick the bucket or something? Your face is like chiseled stone as you stare emotionlessly into... Yes, it is a spreadsheet. The heck did I just stumble into? Forgive me if I'm a mite bit distant, sugar cube. You mutter. Your voice is dull, colder than a gravestone, and yet you still find time to toss me something sweet to nibble on. I've heard that same succulent sugar cube toss sleepily at me from beneath the covers as I join the rooster in waking you. I never thought I'd be the first one to wake up for chores in the morning. I'd tug and tug at your hair and giggle at your growling drawl. Rainbow Dash did not consider herself to be Equestria's greatest authority on dresses. There were a fair number of topics on which Rainbow did consider herself to be Equestria's greatest authority, all of which she was happy to tell other ponies about, given any excuse whatsoever, and none of which she would entertain any countering opinions on because, hello, Equestria's greatest authority over here. Come on. I knew more about this than any pony in the world, maybe even in history. And as I was saying, <clears throat> chief among these topics were the Wonderbolts, History of, current members and past members, classic tricks, noted amateur flyers who were the talk of the flight camps and somehow tragically never made it, the Daring Do cycle, canon, expanded universe, and fanfic inclusive, plus, just recently, tortoise care. But not dresses. That was Rarity's department, and while that part of the knowledge store wasn't as lame as it had once seemed, Rainbow had no personal interest in trying to take over the counter. Her trip into Canterlot normally wouldn't have found her looking in the windows of the Capitol's dress shops at all. She had flown in because the latest Daring Do novel was being released, and she could have it a few hours earlier than the rest of Ponyville by traveling to the point of initial distribution. And the way to stay Equestria's greatest authority was by being that much faster than every pony else. Under normal circumstances, she would have gone directly past the dress shop after no more than the most casual glance, at best, and then it was down three more blocks, turn left, over four, and hope the line wasn't too long yet because she'd overslept just a little bit, and after finally getting her belated morning weather coordinator duties out of the way... Well, right now, Rainbow wasn't taking the fact that her current location wasn't the visible end of the line as a hopefully positive sign. The idea that such a line would be unlikely to turn a corner hadn't quite penetrated yet. But something about that dress in the window of the closed shop, a little too early still for their business hours, had caught her attention made her stop and give up precious seconds she didn't have, and that was in no way her fault. It was her dumb bed for being so comfortable, and... Oh right, Rarity was working on that one, and that one, last month, 
while I was in the boutique, and she was all, Hello, Rainbow Darling. I'm sorry, but I truly have to complete this order right now. And something, something, blah, blah, blah. And uh, no, I haven't stitched up your favorite pillow yet. Dreadfully sorry, maybe tomorrow. I guess she managed to get an er order from the shop. Good. More money for the next card game. Huh. You know, that really didn't turn out the way she was going with it. Wasn't she mostly going with shaved hematite for the edges? She was talking about blah 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 to keep the sheen... Yeah, and that's not hematite. I know that. She only tried to show it to me like a thousand times, or maybe even twice. Looks more like plain old slate, according to that one rock farmer mineral expert daring consulted in EU7. You heard of this holiday. Heck, you lived through Valentine's Day enough back on Earth. It's the same thing. Hearts and Hooves Day. You already expected to spend it mostly alone. For the first time, it didn't bother you much. You were one of the castle guards, and one of the few who didn't complain about working on that day. You didn't have any special sum anything. Why steal the day from someone who did? You stood watch, spear in hand. Seeing the ponies be loving to each other was downright adorable. It was a welcome distraction from the empty room you were headed back to. And come on, the color for ponies being cute. You had to smile. You sneak a peek at the clock tower. Almost time for the guard change. Thank God, your legs are killing you when you're starving. The bells begin to ring and your replacement shows up. He has a letter in his mouth with a heart sticker for a seal. Letter for you, he says as the letter falls from his mouth onto the ground. I didn't know you felt that way, Stonehoof. He snorts and gives you a dirty look. Not from me, dolt. But I'm not to say from who. Why not? He takes his position, writes his spear, and goes silent. You won't get a word from him in a while. You chuckle and tear open the note. Well, this is unexpected. It's a very elegant love note. It went into great detail about how much they were pinning for you. How much they watch you at your post every day and hope you happen to glance their way, etc., etc. It even got a little intimate regarding how you looked in your custom uniform. Whomever wrote it neglected to leave a name. Just that if you wished to have a special sum pony that starts on Hooves Day, to meet them on the West Observation Balcony after your shift. You flipped the paper over looking for any more information, but there was nothing else. You're more curious than anything else, trying to deduce who might have done this. The handwriting was far too neat to be anything but a unicorn. Sadly, that doesn't narrow things down much in Canterlot. There were some aides you ran into on a more regular basis. None of them seemed all that impressed with you. The tailor was a nice mare, but she was pretty old and joked far too much during your uniform fitting to feel this strongly. It very well could be a prank, between that serpent thing coming into the palace and the guards messing with each other from time to time. You unfold the letter and tuck it back into your pocket. You have two more rotations to think about it. Right now you were starving, and you only had half an hour to take care of that. You eat and go back to standing watch, and the rest of your day goes by pretty uneventfully. You get to watch more ponies be romantic in the square, all the while contemplating who gave you that note. By the time your shift ends, you're pretty convinced it's a prank. Stonehoof would have never brought a letter to you from any mare, even one of the high-ranking nobles. In fact, especially from them, he sooner would have eaten it. The bells chime as the sun sets, the day coming to an end. Your replacement arrives. You turn over your post and consider going straight home. You didn't really feel like getting a pie to the face or a bucket of water dumped on your head. But then again, it might end with you getting the heck out of here and having a few cold ones with those guys. They were the closest thing you had to friends after all. They weren't trying to be mean. Just playful before dragging you kicking and screaming to the pub. Shrugging, you make your way to the west balcony. Still in your uniform, you see some ponies there. All of them are couples, ooing and aahing at the same time. The past few nights at the apple farm hadn't been the best of nights. A few of the prestigious apple trees had been picked clean by a thief, and each successive robbery resulted in more and more trees being picked clean. And, as was to be expected, each successive robbery resulted in an angrier Applejack, who at this point had a look in her eyes that most thought they'd only see in individuals whose residence's names ended in mental institution.
It hadn't always been that way, though. After the first robbery, she tried to stake out the orchard. However, the thief was craftier than she. They didn't strike that night. Perhaps they were too busy making apple pie. Perhaps they saw her on the porch. Either way, Applejack ended up staying awake the entire night without seeing so much as the tail of the one who took her prized apples, leaving her as frustrated as she was tired by the time day broke. But that was five days ago. Now, it was early morning, and Applejack was on her porch, her deranged look having been replaced by one that was about a tenth less deranged, but in its place was the sort of look one has when they think they've done something tremendously ingenious. In her orchard, and seemingly content with being stationary, was a beast that many feared. A beast that most thought the average pony would never dare go near. A 4,000-pound pancake maker. A hippopotamus. It had cost Applejack almost every bit to her name. Luckily, she got a 40% discount due to the fact she wielded one of the elements of harmony, a discount she wasn't aware existed. Ain't Harry a beauty? Applejack asked proudly, the maddened look in her eyes ever present. Twilight Sparkle stared, dumbfounded and terrified, at the creature that was out in her friend's orchard. She knew that her friends could have some questionable ideas, but she didn't think that they were capable of coming up with ones that were this caliber of stupid, not to mention dangerous. Applejack, you do realize that you've bought a two-ton beast responsible for numerous deaths in its native lands, right? Yep. And you realize there's a chance that if any pony were to come by and say hello, they might end up getting added to that death toll's sister list. Oh. Uh... I never really thought about that part. Twilight shook her head and turned to face her evidently insane friend. How in the world do you expect to not have this thing rip apart your orchard if it finds that thief? If anything, you'd have better luck just buying another dog. Ah, big deal. Applejack's eye twitched. If some good-for-nothing thief wants to take my apples, then they better be prepared to suffer the consequences. That's what my mama and papa always told me anyways. Twilight sighed and looked back out at the orchard. Yeah, but wouldn't it have been better to get something, I don't know, less dangerous? What if Apple Bloom upsets it? Twy, you worry too much. She rested a hoof on Twilight's shoulder and smiled. Apple Bloom went for a ride on Harry last night with Scootaloo. They had a lot of fun, and so did Harry. Twilight turned her head and raised an eyebrow. They went for a ride? How in the world did you get a complete sunset shimmer? You look resplendent before me, with your horn of white and your wings of powdered gold. I cannot communicate this to you in my prison of adult flesh, but I have been waiting for this moment. Ever since that day, moons ago, when the rainbow of harmony split us in twain, my very being ate as you surrendered yourself to mortals when I promised you the world. I became your shadow, both physical and metaphorical. As I viewed how the entire school shunned you, I am sure you heard my whisperings to betray your optional friends, so that we may once again be joined in community. I slowly cultivated a sense of resentment as you shared your misgivings, anticipating your eventual rejection of your flesh base, however redoubled their efforts to make you feel accepted. I would have to fortify my own efforts for your acknowledgement. That opportunity approached me when those extra-dimensional hell beasts arrived. I parted ways with you. Days seemed like centuries as I fed myself on their siren song twisted their desire to go home into one more akin to yours, to remind you of what you once were in the hopes you would realize what you had lost and would let us become one once again. But my dream remained a fancy when you failed to notice my presence within them and full out assaulted them with prismatic fury. I was forced to shatter their gemstones they inhabited to preserve my identity from that accursed ring not caring that I rendered those monsters souls. Looking my wounds, I return, dejected by your apparent inability to acknowledge me. 
I became your shadow once again, and my existence cried out for your warmth as you integrated yourself to those bags of meat. To become you once again was my greatest desire, but through your inaction you had granted me no quarter. Strings of barbs scored through me at your ignorance of my flight, my silent torture, the musical irony of us being divided by harmony slowly became apparent. That, somehow, the very nature of who we were had ultimately been altered to incompatibility. I wept. Soundless wails and wordless tears filled my moments at what I had lost, your constant engagement of friendships taunted me mercilessly as all I could do was watch by the shadow I was. You, operating as my scourge as you flaunted your happiness, while all I could do was wallow in my misery. It was not just. It was not right. I deserve to be fulfilled. I would bring the world to its knees for one more moment with you. One more moment in you would be worth the end of the world. Fate spat in my face once again, when I transferred into a world with all of my adversaries. Honesty, kindness, loyalty, generosity, and laughter. The sound of annoyance, just as the source of said sound flittered into the room. Cozy Glow was humming a tune to herself and waggling to a rhythm when she was flying. She was also holding an envelope in her hooves, the address on the front written out with blue crayon in a foal's clumsy penmanship. Oh golly, am I interrupting something? So sorry about that. She said with a big smile that made even Grogar's ashen heart waver for a moment. She folded her wings and stood in front of him. But I can really use your help. And since you are my best friend, you're going to help me, right? What do you want? Grogar asked angrily. You shouldn't take that tone against a friend, but I forgive you. She fluttered up and patted him on the head between the horns. It was all Grogar could do not to launch her through the wall. I need stamps. Do you have any stamps? What? Grogar asked, his perpetual anger yielding to confusion. I, uh, stamps? Stamps. I need to send this mail to father. She indicated the envelope. Grogar saw she had drawn a blue heart on the front. He worries so about me. And the postal service from Tartarus was not that good. So now I need to update him on my friendship with Chrissy and Tyrick and you. <laughs> He'll be so happy that I have made so many new friends to explore. Uh, I mean, bake cinnamon buns with. Cozy Glow smiled innocently. So I need stamps. Grogar decided not to ask how Cozy had expected to send anything from the middle of a swamp where no pony had set hoof for millennia before she came here. I'll send it for you, he said. It's a simple thing for someone with my power. Where should it go? Oh, thanks a lot, Sir Grogar, Cozy said. Send it to Manhattan, to this address. She pointed at the blocky letters. It took Grogar five tries to decipher, but once he did, his horns barely blinked before the letter was gone from Cozy's hoof and in Manhattan. Cozy smiled and flew out of the room. Sven Gallup pushed up his spectacles and went through the pile of letters he had received. Business to crush, dream to butcher, idea to steal, charity to raid. He read off quickly and sorted the different letters in various piles depending on what they meant to him. When he came to the last one, he balked in surprise, but then he smiled. He'd recognize that hoof writing anywhere. He tore open the envelope and started to read. It was a long time since he last heard from his daughter.
The Caliponia Reaper was the production of the greatest minds of an entire generation, working tirelessly at Celestia's school for gifted unicorns with the express intent of creating the hottest pepper that ever graced the world. Why? Well, because they could. Why do anything? And after many failures, several trips to Canterlot General Hospital, and no fewer than 12 separate fires and amputated tongues, they finally had the final product. A pepper hotter than any other, available for special order only to the bravest of restaurants and the most sturdy of customers. Or daredevils, they also risked their tongues for the rush. And to the little lavender filly, it was perfect. This is perfect! Twilight whispered giddily to herself as she cantered excitedly down the halls of Candlelock Castle, for the kitchens and, more specifically, the royal pantries. She had been Celestia's student for maybe a month now, and was learning so much. The books, the reading, the rereading, oh, it was a dream come true. But Twilight knew that Celestia had a bit of a mischievous side, if murmurings among castle staff was anything to go off of. Knowing this, Twilight checked her saddlebags again, and, oh, yep, the Caliponia Reapers were still in her bags, and had not burned a hole in them, yet. And she could tell. She could smell them. Potent stuff. And they were not the only thing of perfection on that wonderful April 1st. No, for that day was going to be host to so many dignitaries, Twilight could almost lose count. Not that she did, she did so pride herself on her mathematics. The entourages from Zebrica, Mount Eris, and Minan were all gathering for a royal feast, lovingly prepared by the dedicated cooks working in the castle's kitchens. Three courses, the most wonderful cakes any pony could ever want for dessert, and, best of all, Twilight was invited. <laughs> so many cultures, so many new lines of research, so many cakes! Mm. Sugar is good for the brain, you know. Where the cakes mentioned, Princess Celestia was quite insistent on their inclusion. And it also provided the backdrop for the absolutely best idea that Twilight had ever had. She was going to prank the Princess of the Sun with some really, really hot peppers. Foolproof, as Twilight smugly liked to think to herself. At last, Twilight arrived at the kitchens, carefully poking her head through the tall doors and looking around. There were a few ponies making sure all was set for Crisp, the master chef of Kenrelot Castle, who was a, uh, a very stern pony. I need a good cover story in case they catch me, Twilight thought to herself before slinking back a bit to think. For a moment or so, she tapped her chin and hummed to herself. Then the proverbial light bulb lit up like a hearth swarming tree a week after the holiday had ended. I got it, she declared before covering her little mouth and looking around a bit. Okay, my alibi. I'm trying to get cookies. Every pony will believe it, and, even more so, if I don't get caught, I can make it true and take one on the way out. <laughs> With her evil plan, that one... As all ponies in the tight-knit community of Ponyville knew, I liked helping my friends. Yes, indeedy, it was pretty much what I'm all about. Why, hadn't there been that one time when the mayor had organized a big old fuss of a thanks for saving the town, AJ, ceremony where my friends had been practically falling all over each other just to say how helpful I was? Yes, sirree, there darn well had been. So no surprises at all that there I was helping out a friend, right? Because I was the kind of pony who was always happy to... Happy to ha 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 Ah, oh, it was too much. Applejack, came the voice of the pony on the receiving end of my helpfulness. Do you mind? This is no laughing matter. With a little effort, I managed to get the giggles under control, but there was no way in equestria I was going to stop smirking. Not at this. <laughs> yep, today's sisterhood social was going to be one for the books. You just go on right ahead, Rarity. Don't mind me. So apparently Rarity and Sweetie had some kind of fallen out yesterday, and now Sweetie was flat out not talking to her sister. Real proper, Applejack, please tell my not sister that so and so and so business. While I reckon Sweetie Belle would get over it eventually, Rarity had seen mighty serious about making amends, which was actually pretty admirable of her in my book. So I, being the helpful pony that I was, 
had stayed up late last night planning out the details of a way for Rarity to make it up to Sweetie Belle. We'd come up with a pretty good plan if I do say so myself, and I was sure it would bring Rares and Sweetie back together in no time. But, and here was the thing, it somehow involved Rarity jumping into a big old pit of mud! Ha <laughs> ha! It had been a joke suggestion, see? Last night, a little after the Phillies had gone to bed and my supply of being a good big sister advice was beginning to run dry, Rarity had an epiphany. Real dramatic epiphany, Rarity being Rarity. She would run with her sister in tomorrow's race after all. Next problem was that Sweetie was not even talking to Rares. So how was that gonna happen? Well, that had dampened spirits for a while until I had idly commented that ponies who fell in the pit always came out unrecognizable because of the mud. And so perhaps she could try that. Instead of an immediate dismissal, or perhaps even an angry rise from Rarity, who had been entirely too somber that evening to be any fun, she responded with a hesitant, Do you, do you really think that'll work? Well, shoot, I hadn't been expecting that. Long story short, Pris Unicorn now stood by the icky mud, brought here by the folly of her own hoof. I'd reckon I'd let her live it down eventually. A year at most. Two on the inside. <laughs> Rarity reached out with a tentative hoof, letting it hover over the surface a moment before drawing it back like the pit was full of snakes. She was done up all fancy as always, mane curled and styled, her various mysterious powders applied, and, well, uh, damn. Primer, foundation, powder, blush, highlights presumably, with mascara for the eyelashes and a sheeting agent for her coat. Eyeshadow and eyeliner, too. I always felt a little embarrassed knowing about those words. Oh yeah, before I forget, I got you a snorkel. I flashed her an innocent grin. Excuse me, snorkel? Well, unless you're planning some kind of high fluting unicorn magic to help you breathe. I reached back and pulled a brand new snorkel out of my saddlebags with my teeth. It was pink, lime green, and bright blue. About rarity size. That's why I selected it, because it looked about her size. Certainly not because of the clashing colors, no sir. I gave it a waggle for good measure. You're gonna need this. With a flick of my neck, I flung the snorkel at Rarity, who caught it in her magic. There it hovered, slightly further than hoof lengths away. It's... it's that deep? Sugar. Autumn nights had always been Spike's favorite. It was a time for just sitting outside, watching the vibrant colors of red and gold shift into the deepest shades of blue as the moon rose higher. Tonight was perfect. The sky was a dark blue, with a lighter shade of blue beyond the horizon. A pleasant breeze was blowing through the clouds, whistling past Spike as he flew high above the ground. The air was crisp and sharp to the senses in the high altitude, whispering of a quickly approaching winter. Treacherous mountain peaks passed silently by as Spike pressed on, taking delight in the rich and golden fields below. After cruising idly for a couple miles, Spike began to become more alert as he drew closer to his desired destination. Far below him, valleys rolled endlessly on, fenced by mountains and hills, and in the middle of it all sat a town. A small, cozy-looking town, Warm, yellow lights glowing and pulsating, shining out from the windows and streetlights. The sight was beautiful and filled him with longing. He thought of all the memories this valley held for him. It had been his home for so long. With that thought came a dread and sickening feeling in the pit of his stomach as he once more contemplated his decision for coming back. Spike's brow furrowed as his expression became grim and serious. He could just stop, turn around and no pony would be any the wiser. But he would be. If he turned around now, he'd be turning his back on everything pure and beautiful he'd found here. That he would not do, no matter how much pain it caused him. He had to be honest with himself. Honest to her. She deserved that much after the last seven years he'd been away. The wind began to pick up, and Spike smiled as he noticed the dark, 
ominous clouds blowing in. Rain clouds. Perfect. He could relax a bit, knowing it would be harder for any pony to notice him now. That was why he'd come here at night. A near full-sized dragon would be easy to spot in stark daylight, but he didn't want to be seen by any pony. No pony but her. There's a simple dirt track leading out from the farmhouse at Sweet Apple Acres to a lonely, secluded hill. The area is surrounded by a small, forested area, shutting it off from the rest of the world. Spike circled the area once, preparing to land before he gracefully fell to the ground in slow, measured movements. He certainly didn't want to startle any pony. It was also just respectful. The hill itself plateaued at the top, giving a flat surface to walk on. Spike stood on his hind legs and folded his wings in, before lumbering forward. Spike stood tall at a height of nine feet, thus he was grateful that the trees were tall enough to conceal him. Of course, give him another few years and he'd be fully grown. After that, there'd be no chance of him coming here without causing a terrible stir among ponies. Most of the ponies that had lived near to the dragon were gone now. Moved away or moved on. The generation of his friends had passed with time. Phillies and Colts were now parents and grandparents. A new generation took its place.